Hi, my name is John Eastman. I'm the founder and chairman of the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, a public interest law firm affiliated with the Claremont Institute. I'm also the chairman of the board of directors of the National Organization for Marriage. And both of those organizations are involved in the marriage cases pending before the Supreme Court right now as amici curiae, friend of the courts. Uh, I was asked to become chairman of the board of the National Organization of Marriage a couple of years ago uh, when it became clear that the issues uh, that the National Organization for Marriage deal with were moving m m increasingly into the courts and they wanted somebody to head the organization who was, uh, was a player in the, in, the, in the legal arena as I have been for a number of years. The issue of, of marriage, and particularly the, the uh, claims that we should redefine marriage to encompass uh, same-sex relationships, I think is, is one of the most critically important issues of our day, certainly with respect to domestic policy in the United States. Uh, we've long recognized the significance of marriage as kind of the cornerstone of civilization. Uh, and it's, but it's not just because of the relationship between adults that we recognize the importance of that institution. It's because those particular relationships are the way society procreates and creates the next generation of citizens and transmits our civilizational culture to them. Uh, you look at the Supreme Court's decisions on the importance of marriage, even the cases where they found that marriage is a fundamental right, they always talk about marriage in terms of that biological fact of the complementarity of the sexes and the ability to procreate and, and raise the children that are the offspring of that union. Now that makes you, uh, marriage, uh, opposite sex marriage, but, uh, a, a, a rather unique institution that has a special place in society because of the benefits that society derives from it. Uh, as we weaken that institution and make it into something that it has never been, uh, there may well be fairly significant consequences for civil society. I don't see a, a similarity here if you understand properly why it is that society has fostered marriage in the way it has and the benefits that society has derived from that. And I think the court's decision in Loving versus Virginia, which struck down an anti-miscegenation law, is very instructive. Uh, the court noted there that the color of one's skin is completely irrelevant to the purposes of marriage and therefore it was invidious discrimination to have laws uh, that prohibited people from marrying based on simply the color of their skin. Um, uh, the reason why marriage was fundamental according to that uh, court decision is because of the unique role it plays in civil society and procreation and the rearing of children. Of course that is tied to the complementarity of the sexes which uh, turns out to be an integral part of the institution. The claims now uh, by same-sex couples to uh, want to have access to that institution uh, require that we redefine the institution to be something that's just about adults rather than about that fundamental aspect that, that it, it long existed, which is the procreation and rearing of children. There are lots of regulations that are tied to marriage and federal law said we're going to have a uniform rule no matter what the states are doing with their individual policies for purposes of federal law, for federal tax filings, for federal benefits, social security survivor benefits, all of the other things that, that flow from federal law, we're going to have one uniform definition of marriage so it doesn't change whether you're in Rhode Island or California or Iowa, it's going to be one rule, the federal law is going to apply equally everywhere. That's the provision that's under challenge. And some have argued that it intrudes on the state's right to uh, redefine marriage as they want, and therefore it violates federalism principles. I quite frankly think that argument is a bit silly. Uh, it's never been understood to violate federalism principles when the federal law defines something for only federal purposes, which is all the Defense of Marriage Act does. Uh, I think then the court is gonna have to reach the more substantive challenge that by defining marriage as an institution of one man and one woman, uh, the federal law violates the equal protection component of the federal constitution that you know, the courts have found in the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, or that it interferes with the exercise of a fundamental right that the court would then find. And I think those are exactly the same challenges uh, that are, are playing out in the Proposition 8 case. And I think the court's gonna have to confront them and, and decide whether um, 
Opposite sex and same sex relationships are so similarly situated that to allow the institution to be open only to one and not the other violates equal protection ideas. Or whether a marriage uh, is such a fundamental right, no matter whom you decide to marry, uh, uh, you know, and, and quite apart from the biological complementarity of the sexes that has always been at the core of that institution, uh, whether that's a fundamental right. And if the court finds it is, then that rule is going to then play, uh, uh, be binding in all 50 states of the country and we will have same-sex marriage in all 50 states. One of the things I'm often asked is, why did you become chairman of the board of the National Organization for Marriage? Isn't the trend against marriage uh, as traditionally understood and for redefining it to include same-sex relationships? Why get in the middle of that fight, uh, get ahead of that train and, and be rolled over? Uh, look, that may be well the case. And if it is, it, it kind of uh, runs counter to why the courts should weigh in now. If the democratic process is really moving in a different direction, uh, then the courts ought to let that process play out. Forty years ago, uh, the court stepped in in the middle of a similar political controversy uh, and shut off the political process. So this was on the debate over abortion. And 40 years later, we're still fighting over it in, in rather strident terms because the court did not allow the democratic process to play out. So I think it's a particularly important uh, that the court stay out of uh, this and, and, and not interfere with the democratic process. But I also challenge the uh, underlying assumption that this is a one-way trend and eventually same-sex marriage will be recognized everywhere. Uh, I think there have been 38 states that have taken up the issue now. 35 have said, we're going to stick with traditional marriage, thank you. Only three. Uh, in, a, in a bit of a wave election uh, where the defenders of traditional marriage were outspent by about four or five to one, by more than $20 million, uh, uh, have, have three states by election gone the other direction. So I think the jury is still out on whether this is a trend that's inevitable, that we're going to have same-sex marriage across the country, or rather, in fact, that we're in the middle of a, a very contentious political battle that we don't know yet how it's going to play out. In both cases, the Attorney General, uh, in Proposition 8, the Attorney General of California, and in the DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act cases, the Attorney General of the United States, have refused to defend uh, in the statutes. Uh, in, in fact, in the, in the DOMA cases, the Attorney General of the United States actually switched sides in the middle of the case, uh, something that would get most lawyers in trouble with their ethics bar, <laughs> uh, uh, and then started cooperating with, with the, the previous opponents in the case. Uh, the same thing happened in the California Proposition 8 case. Uh, Governor, uh, now Governor, then Attorney General Jerry Brown, uh, uh, was supposed to be defending the case, but he was actively colluding with the plaintiffs, uh, even in the, in the, to the extent of his responses to deposition questions or, or uh, interrogatories, uh, uh, to, to help the plaintiffs lay the groundwork for their case and concede points that should not have been conceded by any competent lawyer. Uh, it's because of those uh, that, that in the Proposition 8 case, the proponents of the initiative and in the uh, Defense of Marriage Act case, uh, the bipartisan legal advisory group representing Congress uh, moved to intervene to defend the statutes that they had authored. Uh, and, and there's some technical jurisdictional questions at issue here, but I think at the end of the day, uh, particularly given the, the what I call shenanigans, and it's, it's hard to describe it otherwise, of, of the attorney generals, the respective attorney generals, uh, that, uh, that I think it's important that the authors of those initiatives have a right to defend their initiatives so that the initiative gets the full day in court. And technically, there's a Supreme Court case uh, where Justice Ginsburg, writing for the majority, expressed grave doubt that whether proponents of an initiative had standing to defend their initiative if the, if the uh, relevant state officials chose not to do so. Um, but she says in the course of that decision uh, that she finds nothing in that state's particular law that authorizes the, the proponents of an initiative uh, to be the agents of the state in defending the initiative. Well, in the Proposition 8 case, that question was definitively resolved by the California Supreme Court, which expressly held that proponents of initiative stand in as the agents of the state when the attorney general of the state refuses to defend the initiative. And that should, that should settle the matter for purposes of federal court jurisdiction. Uh, and I have no doubt that the Supreme Court will reach that conclusion and then, and then decide to uh, proceed on to the merits of the case.
I can tell you where I think the lineup is and, and, and where the critical vote is. I think there are four pretty solid votes on the left side of the court uh, to strike down Proposition 8, to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act, to find that the Constitution recognizes a fundamental right uh, to redefine marriage to include same-sex relationships. I think there are, on the other side of the court, four votes uh, as solid uh, to uphold the right of the people to define marriage as it has traditionally been understood. Uh, and so that would uphold Proposition 8 in California, and it would uphold the Defense of Marriage Act uh, adopted by Congress. Uh, the critical vote, and I think both sides agree on this, is uh, in the middle in Justice Kennedy. Uh, Justice Kennedy tends to defer to the legislatures. He tends to allow uh, states to go their own way, uh, which would suggest uh, that he both upholds the Defense of Marriage Act and that he votes to uphold Proposition 8. But Justice Kennedy is also the author of the two leading gay rights decisions over the last couple of decades at the court. Uh, Romer versus Colorado, which struck down Colorado's uh, uh, Amendment 2, which uh, attempted to eliminate affirmative action for gays and lesbians. Uh, and he was also the author of the decision in Lawrence versus Texas, which held uh, unconstitutional Texas criminal sodomy statute. Uh, and so it's hard to read into those two cases that Justice Kennedy doesn't have at least a, a leaning toward finding a same-sex uh, marriage right here. He explicitly avoided uh, language uh, in, in Romer that would guarantee such an outcome, but the nuances, the, the tone of the decision suggests that he might be receptive to such an argument. Now, I think it's a dramatically different uh, case and a pretty major step to say we're not going to criminalize this private conduct versus we're going to sanctify it, we're going to recognize it, we're going to alter the definition of marriage to encompass it. Uh, and so he could easily distinguish his prior rulings. Nobody knows whether he's predisposed to try and distinguish it or predisposed to see that as a first step toward a final resolution in favor of same-sex marriage.